Hello and welcome to today's webinar and video recording of growth topics. We're going to talk about the best ways to grow your practice. We have two stars that are <laughs> experts at growth that have done a really good job growing their practice that we're going to uh, hear from today. So uh, when I think about growth in any business, there's a small number of ways to grow. One of the first ways to grow is to do more with existing customers. The second way to grow is to attract new customers. So let's pretend you're a restaurant. You could find more ways to do more with existing customers, right? Maybe add more menu items, suggest you get an appetizer, or maybe stay for dessert, or maybe have a special bottle of wine instead of a cocktail. Whatever it might be, there's ways to do more and expand. There's ways to attract new people to come try the restaurant and become a regular customer. Same thing in a financial advisor business. There's, I've yet to find the practice that has done everything with all their clients. They, they have yet to exist. If you're the first one, congratulations, but I've, I've yet to find it. There's always more that we can do with clients. And we're going to talk about those methods, what they can be. There's always ways that we can attract new clients, better clients in the door. And then an exponential level of that is mergers and acquisitions that are very popular for you. Recruiting an advisor to come in, maybe acquiring another book are, are just other ways you can grow beyond just acquiring one organic client at a time. It's kind of a quantum level or exponential level of growth that exists. So we're gonna cover them all. We're gonna hear uh, from the pros, the examples of what they are doing. And we're really gonna go through that, uh, uh, that progression of doing more with clients. And some of the things I think about, people always ask me, well, what does that mean? What else could you do? And there might be some little things like clients might have some outside assets. There might be some things that you could capture. Uh, maybe you engage some people with financial planning services. Uh, a common one is value and price. You know, what is the value you're providing and the price? Could you maybe offer an option that might be more valuable to them? that might have a higher price associated with it, whether it's asset management services, whether it's financial planning advice services. These are all just some ways that some people just move up. And through doing more with advice, sometimes it opens the door for insurance, which for a lot of you could be you know, a six figure, for some of it, it is a six figure line of business. Um, but really anyone managing a large amount of assets, like a hundred million, I mean, it should really be a consistent six figure line of business in your practice that a lot miss. So there's a lot there, a lot that can be done, but, uh, let, let's hear from people that are actually doing it. Uh, Laura Rabine is an awesome, awesome advisor in Tampa, Florida. She's built out a great team and has another really great advisor on her team as well named Jamie. They do a fantastic job doing more with clients. As a result, I see them attracting a lot of new clients organically from referrals. So thanks for being on, Laura. You're welcome. It's good to know that Brian and I are the pros. <laughs> you are the pros, yes. So okay. Laura, you've done a really great job with the years with clients, capturing opportunities when it comes to the value and the price that you offer. Right. A lot of advisors are really impressed with, with what you do there. So take us through that. I mean, how do you think about like these growth opportunities and then how have you implemented and captured some of these over the years? Well, what it started um, several years ago, I literally was at the point where in like terms of financial planning, I was completely overwhelmed. Like I literally told John, I can't physically do any more than I currently do. And I realized one way for me to make more income is, gee, charge what my worth is. And I realized I hadn't increased my fees in a really long time period. And if you broke it out monthly, people probably pay more to their lawn man or their nail lady or their whatever than they paid to me with all my initials behind my name for financial planning. And yeah. it was it was my hang up that I didn't ask to be given a raise. And um, my previous consultant who I switched from told me, don't do that, don't do that. Because as you know, if you're with Ameriprise, um, we get a bonus based on the number of plans. And I looked at the bonus I would lose if I lost some of my planning clients and I'm like, okay. And I, my bonus was maybe around six grand. And I went and increased my fees with everybody and had that conversation. I had a couple clients laugh at me. They laughed at me. Like, like we wondered why, you know, we wondered why you didn't ask us for more. Like, we know you're worth more and we just waiting for you to, and I'm like, oh my gosh. And then 
I created different levels of planning, different price points, and I stopped mentally. I mentally had them in a, in a spot where I thought they fit, but I stopped telling them where they fit. And I would say, these are the levels I have. Where do you see yourself? And a few of them upcharged themselves. And I'm like, all righty then, check that box. And I lost, I think about $6,000 in a financial planning bonus. I lost some financial plans I didn't have to do anymore, but I gained about thirty dollars to $40,000 of income in my pocket. Thank you very much. And clients were paying me what I was worth and they were fine with it. And I just never asked. And then I made a change in the way my investments are structured. Um, the long and the short of it, I changed my investment structure. So the clients are paying about 25 to 30 basis points less than they used to. Mm. And I'm earning between 50 to 60 to 65 basis points more. It's all coming Amazing. directly in my pocket. And clients Amazing. are happy with that. And people will say, I can't believe you charge so much on investing. I'm like, well, no, I just make it all transparent. It's less than what other people pay, usually. And other people told me that was crazy to do that. But I'm like, clients were fine. If you just are transparent and you explain it, they, they were completely fine with it. So instead of trying to do more with my clients at the beginning, or find a whole bunch of new clients, I just decided, you know, I'm worth more money than this. And they all agreed with me. Yeah. But I think we get, get afraid to ask. Yes, you're you're so right. There's studies out there that confirm that affluent investors with over a million, transparency is one of the biggest things that they want. They want to um, know what they're paying for and where it's going. And what I like about what Laura's done is she's made it simple for them. She stripped back a lot of the costs that were going to other people and more of it's going to her. And guess what? Clients would rather pay you as their advisor. Right? They don't want it to go to someone in a big building. I, never I met. have some clients that specifically said, oh, yeah, I, I would rather you and your team get it. Yes, 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 yes. So it, it's it's a... Um, you said it's it's really thinking differently. It's a mindset shift to think a little bit differently about this and get out of our own way because it's all we all hold ourselves back when it comes to the value we offer in the price we talk about, especially those clients we've worked with for a really, really long time. Oh, I can never go back to the Joneses and change their fee. They're so nice. They've been with me so long. It's the fear of losing them to kind of arises and, and it, comes about. And it actually got to the point where like I remember a conversation that one team member was having with the client and they were kind of giving a little bit of pushback on the planning fee. And that person just, I think it was a female client because the person said like, do you get your nails done every month? They're like, well, yeah, but what do you, what does that have to do with anything? Yeah, you probably paid them more than you pay her. I think you can afford it. And they went, oh yeah, okay. Um, we just, we get, we get afraid to ask. And if somebody yeah. says, no, that's great. It's less work I have to do because I'm tired. I, you know, at that point I was exhausted. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I won't do the work. Yeah. No, it, it's it's a, a huge opportunity for all of you. And for anyone out there that needs help going through that, um, I, I like to call it the uh, uh, really just total cost comparison. Like what, what's the total cost they're paying now? What could their arrangement look like? If anyone knows he needs help, go. I, I'm looking a lot of you on here have been through that over the years, but um, uh, anyone needs help with that, let, let me know. It's a wonderful opportunity. And I think a lot of times too, you know, the, look at how much room uh, Laura created to save money for the client. I mean, it's pretty no brainer that, wow, I'm going to be paying less and you know, it's more for the advisor. It's, it's a, a total win-win. But sometimes too, some people will package in that financial planning fee increase that they always wanted to do. Um, right. So those old $500 a year plans could be, you know, 2,500 and be a super small, you know, percentage in the uh, grand scheme of what the the client has with you. So a very, very easy way to um, just upgrade people and uh, uh, do more, right? We're talking mm -hmm. about doing more. Now, as you've done some of this, Laura, you, you've really created a great, you know, client experience with, with clients who do a lot for them. Um, how has that led to like referrals and all these new people that's that you and Jamie bring in the door? Well, I think by not trying to be everything to everybody and be do a whole bunch of stuff for not a, enough money, 
it's given us room in our schedule and room in our calendar to spend the time building the relationships and in doing stuff for clients. And we're a really high touch, high service practice and um, clients refer us. And so there, there's more involved in that, but clients are happy with us. They feel engaged with us. They they feel they have a relationship with us because we have the time to, to spend on them. And if you're charging a tiny fee to work with a tiny client, it probably takes too much of your time that it's not worth it in the end. If you would just, you know, say goodbye to that smaller business and focus on getting the larger business, your clients will be happier because you have more time to spend with them. And, and it's amazing when, when people ask me, hey, how do I bring in new clients, you know, new good, new seven figure clients? It starts there. You do a good job for the existing people, especially your better clients, just happens. And there's so many practices out there. I see some of you on that. You just do a good job for people. It just happens. You don't have to do a ton of events and activities. It just, you do a great job. The experience is enhanced. People will refer you and, and bring you in. Now, Laura, you do do some other activities outside of just you know, getting referrals. We do. Um, what's some of the other activities that have worked that have helped give you access to other really good clients that are, or I should say prospects that have become clients? Uh, Jamie does several networking groups and she found a really good niche in a couple local groups where she fits really well. But we also do, not do a lot, but we get a lot of people that just call us because they're looking for an advisor in our area, which has never happened before I moved to my current location nine years ago. But everybody that's interested always looks at your website and a lot of people might look at your Facebook. And so mm -hmm. we spend a lot of time keeping that fresh and up to date. We even several months ago hired, so you can go check my website and give me more traffic, but we hired a videographer to do videos for us because we tried to do it ourselves and we were terrible at it. Like it's just not our skill set. And this woman that we hired was amazing and we look better in the videos than we do in real life. Um, and she put together several videos that we could put on there. So it goes alongside the videos that Ameriprise does for us because People will check out you on check you out online before they even come and talk to you. And so you have to keep it really professional, but you have to be relatable. I mean, I had a client years ago come to me because it was Ameriprise, but also she saw pictures of my dogs on there and we had similar dogs. And she's like, I know you must be a good person because you have dogs. Oh. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'll take it. You know, so if you keep it personable, um, that helps. But you have to keep all of that fresh and you have to have good content. Such great advice. I mean, the, the client experience starts there. It is, it, it's great learning though, that people are going to check out the website. They're going to look at you on, on Facebook and just being current personable, not just a financial planning robot, but a human showing your interest. Uh, it makes you real and it makes you more relatable. So and if it's, you did, uh, um, and almost like if, if you have a Facebook page, if you do things on your Facebook page that aren't necessarily the boring financial topics, because quite frankly, a lot of our topics that are canned are boring because it's finances. But if you do personable stuff, there are ways to do it where other people will will most likely repost it or comment it. And so if people just see your practice name over and over and over, even if you didn't do business content then it, it'll it stick in their head. I mean, we've done crazy little Facebook lives and like making Halloween cocktails and stuff like that. And it just, people see it and they'll stop and look at that if it's not always the, you know, where's the market? Fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Well, thank you for being on, Laura. It was absolutely insightful. If anyone needs help or needs help with some of these things, just, you know, email me, reach out to me. I'd love to help you through it. But big opportunities with clients. Think the highest volume, you know, amount of revenue, managed assets, wrap assets, uh, financial planning, big opportunities for growth right there. You do some of that, it leads to other things like insurance and a great experience leads to the referrals, being current online because the referrals are gonna check you out, makes it even easier. And you know, there's some activities and things that, that you can do too, but you do these fundamentals, it's just a flood of new people coming in the door. So awesome job growing, Laura. Thanks for sharing the uh, knowledge as, as one of the pros with uh, everyone here looking to learn. Thank you. You're welcome. And we have Brian Altman, who's partners with George Petulis in New Jersey, just out outside of Philadelphia. And uh, I, I think the different growth methods you see here are really neat. I think Brian and George have been really experts in, in not only these areas, but also have done a lot in the mergers and acquisitions areas of bringing in other advisors to their team, 
how an acquisition. And it's really cool to see what's happened in really not a, a long period of time. So, so Brian, just take us through, you know, just, just, you know, let's rewind a little bit when you were looking to grow through some different methods that were beyond the traditional organic methods. Um, what were you thinking as you were embarking on the, these new endeavors? Yeah, so George and I both kind of uh, had the mindset that, uh, quite frankly, what we needed is is more at bats, and quite frankly, that means more getting in front of clients. We look at some of the people that are in our market group writing the level of business that they're writing, and it basically said to us, "Man, we should be the we should be the top producers." So what we started doing is is going and talking to advisors about buy sell agreements. Um, a couple of those we've added. We hit up all of our wholesalers for referrals to people that might be um, considering selling their business. A couple of those materialized and turned into practice purchases that happened over the course of the last 12 to 16 months. Um, so in getting ourselves ready for that, we kind of uh, added an AFA. We added two staff folks that were um, XP1 uh, support staff. One of them had just been fired and they were best friends. So when we brought on one, it was kind of logical that we would bring on the other. Um, and in particular, we targeted practices that had a little bit of a different forte, which my partner George has a lot of success with 401k plans. In particular, converting 401k participants into uh, retail customers. So when we were thinking about the clients that we want or the uh, practices we wanted to target, that was first on our list is going after someone that had large scale 401k presence. So the practice that we closed on in January was about, I think about 270 million in assets, 190 million of it was 401k assets. So our our goal is basically to get those 401k customers, which now we went from having maybe we had four or 500 participants. Now we have probably 3000 participants. So we kind of have a quarterly quarterly model where we get in front of the um, participants, do seminars, meet with them one on one. We actually just came back from one of our 401k plans up in New York City uh, to meet with the participants. I think that was our first, at least our first in-person one with the practice that we that we purchased. Um, and quite frankly, I it's uh, it's that is our growth strategy. So that awesome that that two hundred and seventy million dollars, I would be surprised if that has not turned into two or three times that within about five to seven years. It's really remarkable. It's amazing, you know, exponential level of growth, and it's a different game. Um, some people. I think dip their toe in the water and and want to, you know, I guess do something in this quantum realm of of growth. But as you heard, George and Brian were doing the activities. It's almost like going back and being a brand new advisor with no clients. That hey, you got to find a way to get access to some advisors. So just going to people they knew, like natural market. Hey, what would happen if if you know you God forbid you're in a car accident? What do we do? Well, hey, why don't we have a buy sell? And then sometimes people say, well, we have a buy sell. I'm thinking about retiring or selling some clients, you know, be able to do that with you guys. And then leveraging contacts, wholesalers, right? Other people that have lots of advisors in their contacts every week. I mean, what a great resource to, you know, partner with and say, hey, we're looking to help some people out who might want to get out of the business or might want a successor. And, and it's amazing how that can work. So um, they've done the activities. They, they've they really gotten in there and done it. And um, and then, you know, with more swings at the bat, got some hits here. And um, that's really the name of the game. It is the activities here really need to be done on the front end. We see some people just take like one or two swings and say, ah, this didn't work out. It wasn't for me. But there were there were a lot of swings. And, um, you know, I'll, you, in 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 baseball, which is an American sport, softball, American sport, I think anyone can relate to um, a, a baseball softball player typically has a lot more swings and misses than they do connections and hits. 
right? It, it's typically the the way it goes, and it's very much that way in this mergers and acquisitions game. So, I mean, tell us about that, Brian. This is a discourager for most people. I mean, what's kept you going to get through the swings and misses to get to some of these hits where you've recruited people, you've you've landed acquisitions. Um, what kept you going through the process? Yeah, and I, I can't speak for George. I, I kind of know what my philosophy is. I've got um, two kids. I got a five year, a six year old, a 12 year old, a 15 year old. Kind of my vision is 10, 15 years from now, bringing my kids into the business. And I want it to be a successful, repeatable process that if they could step into the business, that they could make it be as successful as we've made it. So that's kind of my driving, driving motivation. I, I, I think what we've learned, we've learned some hard lessons. So one of the practices we purchased, we kept the previous advisor on staff as part of a three-year consulting agreement with the 401k plans. We actually had her be a third partner, so she's still engaged in those. Um, versus another practice, we did not do that. And quite frankly, I would tell you, we failed in that one by not having it be the way that we had with the larger practice. Having con continuity, having the ability 12 months in to have the seller be part of those meetings, I would tell you, I wish we could go back in time and redo the other deal that we did, quite frankly. So we, we, we learned some hard, we let we learned some lessons the hard and expensive way, but that's OK as long as we learn from them. Yeah, yeah. And that's uh, part of the process, too. I mean, it really is. And, um, you know, any humans we learn from. It's good to get out there and do it and make some mistakes, but uh, but we learn from it. It makes the next ones even better. I think people that have um, many acquisitions um, would tell you that, that, gosh, if. if I could go back and tell myself how to do the first couple, like I've done number eleven and twelve. <laughs> be much better, but it's a it's a different game, right? It's a whole nother um, level of the business, and it's it's really interesting level of the business. Um, I like something else you talk about, Brian. Is is you know which is something Laura's done is is bring in another advisor to help. I mean, there's so many so much time in the week. I mean, time's a resource you can't replace in business. And so uh, bringing in another advisor to help with the workload. Um, what was your thinking there? What was that like to bring somebody else in to help you and George with your clients? Yeah, so, so we actually did that probably two years. So we kind of knew what we wanted to accomplish in five years. So our, our AFA has been with us for about three years. The reality is what we're learning is we probably need two more and we need them like yesterday. So <laughs> what we're finding is things are ex exploding so quickly that it's hard for me to really bring on that many more clients myself, right? So ideally what we need to have happen over the course of the next three to six months is have competent AFAs that we can start handing off some of our clients to, or start maybe go hire a more senior advisor as well as a couple AFAs so we could do more of like a diamond team, which John has has coached us on a couple times. Um, the reality is we look at kind of how fast things have snowballed and it's like, man, if this keeps going, like we can't work 100 hours a week. So yeah, we, we need we need to come up with a uh, we need to find the right hires. And I would say I think that's a lot harder than finding practices to buy. Great point. It's a really, really good point, a good lesson for everyone to listen to out there that it's needed from a capacity standpoint, but it's it's hard. It takes time to fight that right, find the right person, right fit. Um, anyone out there wants to learn about diamond teams that hadn't heard me talk about, just, just reach out. It's a capacity concept. It's just a way to structure other advisors so that, like, for example, Brian doesn't have to leave the client relationship. He can still be involved, but he's not going to do, let's say, four interactions a year. He might do two or might do one. And other advisors surrounding the client would handle some of the other interactions. That way, he's got a lot more capacity. He can still stay involved, but he can take on more people, convert 401k clients to financial planning and rollover clients, or work on the next acquisition, uh, the next hires, all those kind of things. So it, it's a um, you you can see it's it's there's so many ways to grow this business. We have infinite opportunities. There's ways to grow with what you have. There are ways to grow organically to do a great job for clients, get referrals to other clients. And there's ways to grow, you know, in this quantum realm and this mergers and acquisition. 
and there's unlimited opportunities there. We love helping advisors, you know, achieve these great growth problems to have. You know, it's a good spot to be in that we're working through Brian, but it's a, a good, you know, what a great problem to have, to have so much business and so many clients that um, just can't handle it. I mean, that's a dream for a lot of advisors. So, so as, as you really close out the list this year strong for all of you listening, as you, you, you know, look at next year, I, I would think about these really three main growth methods of opportunities with clients, organic growth, merger and acquisition quantum growth think about what's what's right for you they're all different uh, there's not a ton of practices that are good at all three at the same time usually a lot of practices are good at one maybe two there are some out there that have it all three going which is which is great but it's usually a specialty in one or maybe two areas that they're pretty good at so think about um uh your growth what's going to work for you and what methods will take you to that next level there but thank you for uh, sharing brian it was really fantastic we love hearing from the stars here and uh again thank you to to you laura it's great to hear from both of you and what's working out there so uh email us let me know if you have any questions i'm happy to answer them or to give you any resources you might need to help you grow but uh it's fun to have the stars on. It's fun to have the pros and hear directly from them. So thank you for sharing. Thank for all of you for being on live, for listening to the replays. And everyone, stay awesome out there. We'll see you soon. Thanks, John. Thanks.